open up your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, we're in our second study in our series through the book of Daniel, and that's what made me think of the two. Every time we get together on a Sunday morning, I, I think about it often. I think, here we are, we come together, we worship God in song, we pray, we hear about the good things God's doing in our midst, uh, we spend time understanding God's word and how it applies to our life. And we just think, these things Christians have been doing for 2,000 years, and not just going back a long way, but all around the world, Christians are doing those things. It just makes us part of God's great work that he's doing throughout the ages. And I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad we can spend this time in God's word together. Daniel chapter 1, beginning now at verse 8. Let me read verse 8 to you. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. All right, we got to enter into Daniel's experience just a little bit here. Uh, imagine a young man from our congregation, a high school young man, a uh, really high achiever, uh, comes from a good, solid, well-established family here in town, a, a, a family that has some resources behind it, a family that's got connections in the schools, uh, influence in the city government. The, the dad is a real force in the marketplace here in Santa Barbara. Just you know, kind of one of those high achiever families in our community. And, and the young man who's a high school student, his name is Danny, let's call him. And uh, what happens to Danny? Well, and I'll just say this off the top of my head, the, the Iranians come and invade Santa Barbara. And uh, they make their headquarters at Oprah's house. <laughs> and they decide that they're gonna take the best and the brightest of our young men and take them back to Tehran and enlist them in the civil service over there. And so Danny from our congregation gets taken. He had a future for an Ivy League school or one of the military academies. Uh, he had a future of real influence right here in Santa Barbara. That's what he looked forward to. That's what his family looked forward to. But all of that's interrupted because quite apart from any part of his choosing, he's taken away from the place where he lived at his home, the place where he loved to live. He's taken out of his culture. He's taken out of his uh, environment of a supportive faith community around him. He's taken to a place with a different language, with idol worshipers, with everything around him. And he's taken to Tehran, just to use a weird example, and say, here you are. Now what are you going to do? That's Daniel. Daniel is taken from Jerusalem, from his community, from the temple, from his language, from everything around him and transported to Babylon and expected to thrive in a high achieving environment where he was going to be part of the civil service of the king of Babylon. Now, that meant he was enrolled in the school of the Babylonian young people to train them for civil service. It was a three year program and as part of his education, they gave him a meal ticket to the king's cafeteria where the king and his highest level advisors, where they ate every day, Daniel got to eat at the same buffet line. He could go in there every day. But that didn't sit so well with Daniel, as we just read in verse 8. It says that when Daniel walked into the king's cafeteria and he saw all the food and he saw the wine and he saw the whole situation, Daniel took a look over and he said, no, it's not for me. Matter of fact, he didn't just say, it's not for me, but he said, notice the words there in verse 3. He said, excuse me, verse 1, excuse me, verse 8. <laughs> I'll get it by the third try, I promise. He said that he would not defile himself. The ancient Hebrew word defile carries the idea of polluting or staining, and it's a religious word. Daniel requested that he might not defile himself, and that implies that he explained the spiritual basis for his request. In other words, he didn't want to make it sound like the only reason he didn't want to partake of the king's food was because of health reasons. He didn't, he didn't pull out the gluten-free card on them. 
He didn't say, no, this is not organic. I, I can't eat it. He didn't say any of that. No, there was a spiritual reason behind it. And Daniel's spiritual reason was this. This food will defile me. I'm not going to partake of it. And he made that request to the people in the government up above him. Now, there's one thought that I want to hit right away before I explain why Daniel thought it might defile himself. I want to explain, first of all, and just bring us back to the idea that even though we find so much respect and admiration for this man Daniel throughout the book of Daniel, it's always good to remind ourselves we are not Danielians, we're Christians. Daniel didn't die for our sins, Jesus Christ did. And what we find in the book of Daniel and so many of the things that we like and admire about Daniel, we should like these things about Daniel, we should admire them, but we see them in Daniel and we see them in an even greater measure in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you understand what an amazing thing it was for Jesus throughout his life to determine, I will not defile myself? That Jesus lived a completely sinless life, which Daniel never did. But, but Jesus said, I will not defile myself. When, when he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, he said, I will not defile myself. When, when he was tempted or tested on any side, Jesus said, no, I will keep myself pure because Jesus had to remain pure to be the spotless son of God who could be sacrificed on our behalf. When Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, there was no sin in him him that he had to pay for therefore his work on the cross could be for us because it was not for him it could be for us and the reason why it was not for him was because he never defiled himself aren't you grateful that you have a savior that never defiled himself and therefore is able to rescue you and is able to rescue me this is a beautiful thing now when we talk about daniel though what was Daniel's reason? Why did he look at the food and it bothered him? What was defiling about it? Well, I can think that there were at least three reasons why Daniel looked at the king's cafeteria and thought it might defile him. Number one, that food was undoubtedly not kosher. Any of the meat that was served in the buffet, either it was pork, which was not kosher, or maybe other animals that were considered not to be. Maybe there was a big lobster buffet and lobster's not kosher. Or... The meat that was kosher according to the animal, it was not slaughtered in a kosher way. There were kosher rituals not only for what kind of meat, but also for how the meat was prepared. And that was important too. So Daniel looked at me because this isn't kosher. I can't eat it. That was reason enough, but it wasn't the only reason. Also, we know undoubtedly that in that culture, meat was sacrificed to idols. Look, in the ancient world, they were very practical. They said, we're going to slaughter this cow anyway. Why don't we sacrifice it to one of our Babylonian gods before we slaughter it? There we killed two birds with one cow, so to speak. We honor our Babylonian god and we get meat to eat. It's a win-win situation. So in the ancient world, it was very common for whatever meat was served or eaten had been sacrificed to an idol when this was in pagan lands. And Dan said, I'm not going to be part of that. But then there was a third aspect to it as well. Daniel understood that eating the king's food implied fellowship or sharing with the Babylonian cultural system. And Daniel wanted to keep a distance between himself and the Babylonian cultural system. You see, Daniel didn't object to the food just out of health reasons. Now look, we're going to see later on that Daniel had what we would call today a vegetarian diet. It's going to tell us that in the following verse. Okay, Daniel had a vegetarian diet. And, and I know that many people eat a vegetarian diet because it's healthier for them, and that's wonderful. There are probably no doubt many benefits that come to a person by eating a vegetarian diet. But I don't think that it was primarily the health benefits of this that interested Daniel, even though God blessed him with good health from it, as we'll see. This was the thing he decided, I will not defile myself, and the concept there is spiritual. Please note, Daniel didn't object to it when they gave him a new name. Your name's Daniel. We're going to call him Belteshazzar. Daniel said, who cares? I know who I am. Call me whatever you want to call me. 
Daniel didn't object to it when they gave him a Babylonian education because Daniel said, I'm rooted. I'm grounded in what I know. Teach me whatever the Babylonians want to do. I, I know how to sort that out because I know what I believe. But when they tried to give him food from the king's table, Daniel said, no, this will be direct disobedience to God's word and I'm not gonna go there. So what did he say? Look at the verse eight, says, therefore he requested. Daniel was bold enough to stand up and make the request. You could say that Daniel made a big deal over a little thing. Daniel, what's wrong with you? It's not gonna kill you to eat the king's food, it's good. Daniel, many of your fellow Hebrew captives are eating the king's food. Big deal. Just go along with the flow. Why did Daniel and his three companions say no? It was because Daniel realized that his relationship with God touched every area of his life, including what he ate. Isn't it interesting that the root of sin in the human race goes back to something somebody ate? And Daniel said, no, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna disobey God's word by what is commanded in it regarding kosher laws and kosher meat. I'm not gonna eat that. And this was Daniel's determination. And this was an especially challenging and courageous decision when we think of the reasons why it was a difficult decision to make. Look, I don't know if you are like I am, but sometimes I can be an expert I'll use the word genius when it comes to thinking up excuses. I mean, I don't know if it's a spiritual gift or not, but I can be a pretty good excuse maker. And I can come up with excuses for why I shouldn't do what God tells me to do. And when I look at this, I think of all the reasons why Daniel could have made excuses here. Daniel could have made this excuse. He goes, look, it's the king's menu. If I reject the king's menu, I'm rejecting the king, and that could get me punished. D Daniel could make another excuse. He could say, listen, if I reject the king's menu, I'm going to stand out among the others. Brothers and sisters, this is a big one. Many of us, more than anything, fear standing out as a Christian. We will try to avoid it at all costs. We're fine with our Christianity as long as it's secret. But if it comes to a situation where we might have to stand up and say, well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. No way. I don't want to stand out and be identified as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a Christian, as a follower of his. This is a huge challenge for us. There's something in us that says, I just want to blend in. Daniel wouldn't do that. Daniel would raise his hand and say, I will do it. And this, I think what God calls us to today in that regard, it's not some extraordinary boldness. It's just being normal. N normal is to say this. I'm a Christian here on Sunday morning. I'll be a Christian on Monday morning. Th that's just normal. You, you're not, I'm not telling you to get a bullhorn and go up and down State Street. I'm a Christian and you're all going to hell. No, please don't do that. If you want to do that, don't tell anybody that you come to Calvary Chapel, please. <laughs> that part you can't keep secret. Just no, no, no. So I'm not talking about extraordinary bull. I'm just talking about normality. Normality says, yes, normality would say something like this. Hey, what'd you do over the weekend? Well, um, I went to the movies, and uh, we walked on the beach, and I went to church. <laughs> you hope you say it in a way they don't hear it. Normality would just say, well, yeah, this is what I did this weekend. Again, just not afraid to stand out. That Daniel could have said, I don't want to stick out, but he didn't say that. Daniel could have understood this. If I refuse the king's food, I'm going to get branded as uncooperative and it's going to spoil all my chances of advancement. Hey, listen, we know how it is in the world today. If you want to get along, you got to go along. You want to advance, you got to play the game. Don't stick out. Don't be a squeaky wheel. You just play along just like everybody else says, I got to advance. I'm a young man. I'm on my way. I got to do this. No, he didn't give that excuse. Daniel could have given this excuse. He could have said, there is a real threat of punishment if I do this. 
Kings in the ancient world were known for being brutal in their punishments to those who opposed them. This same king, Nebuchadnezzar, in just a few chapters, he's going to throw some young men into a fiery furnace. This is the guy you're messing with. And Daniel could say, look, I would oppose some people for the sake of God, but not this guy, but he didn't even go there. I'll give you a few other excuses. Listen, isn't it true that the food itself was probably pretty attractive? When you're eating at the king's cafeteria, what do the buffet tables look like? It, I mean, this, looks like, this is great looking food. And, and you walk in and go, man, I want that. It looks great. But Daniel said, no, I'm not going to do that. There was another reason why I think it would have been easy to make an excuse just because of the distance. Daniel could have looked at the geography and said, listen, I'm more than 500 miles away from Jerusalem. All that life is a long way away. I'm away from home. I'm not around my family. Nobody's watching me. Who's going to know? Daniel didn't make that excuse. But then the last excuse, I think, what have I given you, about five or six excuses? I told you I'm good at making excuses. The last excuse I think Daniel could have made might be the most damaging one. Daniel could have said this. God let me down. I'm going to do whatever I want. I mean, after all, not everybody in Jerusalem was carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Not yet. That would happen in about 20 years. Daniel could say, why did I get singled out? Why am I here? God, I prayed I wouldn't end up in Babylon, and here I am. God, you let me down. <laughs> you let me down. What do I owe to you? You let me down. I'm going to do what I want. I don't have to be a prophet to think that there's got to be at least one person in this room that you're challenged by that very thought. You'd never say it out loud because, look, you're here at church. You're not supposed to talk that way in church. But this is how you feel. You feel, God, you let me down, so I'm going to do whatever I want. If that's where your heart is, let me speak to you just for a moment. I'm not going to try to talk you out of your feeling that God let you down. I'm just not even going to talk about that. But I will tell you to do this. Take your feeling to God with complete honesty and transparency. Get completely authentic before God. I get it why you don't wear it on your sleeve here at church. I, I get it why at greeting time you don't shake my hand and say, Hi, Pastor David, I think God let me down and now I don't care about doing what he says. I get that. It, uh, right? That would be weird if you did that. But listen. Listen. You need to be real. You need to be authentic before God. You need to get alone with God and bear your heart with him in a way that you haven't done before. And you need to say, God, you disappointed me. I feel crushed by that. And I don't know what to do now. When you open up your heart with that kind of transparency and honesty before God, that, that's going to begin some healing in your life. But Daniel didn't go there. Daniel wouldn't rely on that thing. You let me down, God, so now I'll just do whatever I want. No, Daniel instead, look at what it says in verse 8. It says that he purposed, or, or in the ESV it says resolved. Daniel purposed in his heart. And, and there were many practical ways that Daniel resolved or purposed in his heart to show no compromise. I mean, very practically, Daniel set his heart Daniel made up his mind beforehand that he would not compromise. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it worked like this with Daniel? He got a ticket for the king's cafeteria. Did he said, you know what? I don't think I'm going to eat in there, but let me go inside and check it out first. Do you think he surveyed the whole thing and then tried to make up his mind? I don't think so. Man, he was set. He determined before. No, I know what's in there. I'm not going to go there. And so often our walk with God is, I'm going to determine beforehand that I'm going to do what's right before God. You leave it up to the moment to make up your decision, what are you going to do? Man, you're going to falter. You're going to fail. No, there needs to be this determination beforehand. You, you need to commit yourself to purity in that relationship when you're not married. You need to commit yourself to purity in that relationship before it gets hot and heavy. If you wait until the moment, you're not going to have the strength. No, he purposed in his heart beforehand. That was one aspect. But secondly, very practically... Daniel 
resolved or purposed in his heart, he did it in a positive way. We don't see Daniel doing a bitter, hate-filled, you stinking Babylonians and your rotten food, I hope it all burns. Daniel's like, look, you guys do whatever you want, but as for me, I'm not going to partake in it. I'm going to determine in my own heart it's not going to be for me. Isn't that an important way to do it? That when you need to make a stand for God, you do it in a way that's winning, that's positive. Because Daniel found favor with his superiors, as we'll see in the very next verse. It shows us, too, that when Daniel purposed in his heart, his protest was polite. He didn't go on a hunger strike. He said, may I be excused from the king's table? What wisdom in Daniel to make it polite. We also see that Daniel did it in a way that emphasized his own self-denial. Daniel said, I'm going to do this in a way that puts the cost on me. I'm not looking for the cost to be passed on to somebody else. This will be my self-denial. But then finally, Daniel was bold enough to be put to the test. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But listen, Daniel just said, put me to the test in this. Go ahead. I'm ready for my faith to be put to the test. I like what Charles Spurgeon said on this point, preaching on this passage. Spurgeon said this, quote, I think that a Christian man should be willing to be tried. He should be pleased to let his religion be put to the test. There, says he, hammer away if you like. Do you want to be carried to heaven on a feather bed? Do you always want to be protected from everybody's sneer and frown and go to heaven as if you were riding in the possession, procession, I mean, on the Lord's mayor day? We would say the fiesta parade. Is that how you want to get to heaven? Like, like you're going to the fiesta and everybody's applauding you. I love what Spurgeon said. Do you want to get carried to heaven on a feather bed? That's not how it works, is it? No, Daniel was bold enough to say, let's put it to the test. That was the way that he very practically resolved and purposed in his heart to do it. And look at the result from it. One result was in verse 9 where it says, now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. God gave Daniel favor. God did not abandon those who stood for him. And and I can't tell you how often it works out to be exactly that way. We get all nervous when we're going to make a stand for Jesus Christ. We think people reject us. And you know what people often do when we make a polite principled stand for Jesus, lo and behold, they respect you. They're like, wow, here's someone standing for what they believe. There's a person of integrity. That that woman is honest. I can trust her. Oftentimes we're so ready for people to despise us, and oftentimes we find that we come into favor by making a bold stand for Jesus Christ. Well, now verse 10 Daniel's going to suggest this plan. He says, And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your face as looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servant for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. I love how Daniel put it there in verse 12. Please test your servants. Come on, test us. Put us to the test. You see, Daniel was sensitive enough to realize that the guy who was over the Hebrew servants, this, this man who was their manager, that if he saw that Daniel and his friends suffering, the man in charge of them would get in trouble. Daniel didn't expect other people to suffer for his principles. Sometimes we're really good at that as Christians. We're make, good at making other people martyrs for our principles. Daniel said, no, man, I get you. I understand. I don't want you to be a martyr for my principles. Let's just put it to a test. 10 days. We're in this program for three years. 10 days isn't going to make a difference. Let's do a 10-day test. And all we're going to do is we're going to be put to the test and we're going to see how it looks afterwards. There was something so reasonable and good about Daniel's approach. He didn't go on a hunger strike. He made a polite request and he made it to the right person and he said, put it to the test. 
And by the way, let me just say this one more time to remind us about our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't it true that this was Jesus in his whole ministry and especially at the cross? There's Jesus before the scribes and the Pharisees. Put me to the test, Jesus said. There's Jesus before Satan in the wilderness being tempted. Put me to the test, he says. There's Jesus with every weird question his disciples would ask. Put me to the test. There's Jesus on the cross bearing the sin and shame of all humanity for us. He says, put me to the ultimate test and I will come through. And that's what Jesus did. But Daniel did it in his own little way. And in verse 12, it says, give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, vegetables there refers to all kinds of grains and plants and not strictly vegetables. Basically, Daniel said, put us on a vegetarian diet. I got no problems with the king's broccoli. I just don't want to eat the king's beef. And so he put us on a vegetarian diet and let's see what happens. Well, what happens? Look at it there in verse 14. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Then the steward took away the portion of their delicacies and the wines that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. What happened after the 10 day test? Well, look at it right there in verse 15. Their features appeared better and fatter. God blessed them with better health. Now, I have to say, whatever someone might say about the benefits of a vegetarian diet, which are fine, I see the hand of God in this. Because I could see where they would have equal health to the other people who ate whatever, but it was the hand of God that after only 10 days made them better and fatter than the people who were eating in the king's cafeteria. I can't see any biological reason why a vegetarian diet would make them appear better and fatter so quick. Maybe it would make them appear the same as the other Jewish men, but not better and fatter. And after only 10 days, you, man, those guys look healthy. Look at how good they look. And man, they've gained a few pounds. Man, Daniel, look. You, you look so healthy. You look so plump. You, you, you know, back then, fatness was seen as a sign of health. What... What a change we've come to in the <laughs> 2,500 years since. And so, man, you're looking good there, Daniel. This is fantastic. And again, there was a spiritual, well, whatever biological mechanism God may have used, there was a spiritual reason behind it. God blessed them with better health. But that wasn't the only thing. Look at it here for the other results, starting in verse 17. It says, and as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Look at all the ways that God blessed Daniel's principled stand when he said, I'm not going to compromise in this area. First of all, as we saw in verse 15, God blessed them with better health. But now look at the second one in verse 17. It says, God gave them knowledge and skill. God blessed them with better brains. They had intellectual ability, um, not just with Daniel, but with his companions. And it wasn't primarily due to their diet, but the special intervention of God. Now, there are some people who think that it was the diet especially that God used. I like what John Trapp, the old Puritan, com every once in a while I bust out a, a comment from John Trapp, li lived like in the 16th century. John Trapp said this, Puritan commentator, this slender diet was of some help to their studies for loaden bellies make leaden wits. I, I think they should put that over every dorm room there at the college campuses. Load and bellies make leaden wits. Well, whatever the health benefits directly of it was, don't you see something supernatural going on here? God gave them great wisdom and understanding intellectually. 
They gave themselves to the Lord in a remarkable way and God blessed them in a remarkable way. This is sort of an outworking of what we see in the Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Lord, I'm going to give myself fully to you and I'm going to trust that you're going to bless my brain, that you're going to bless my body. And I'm not trying to say that if you give yourself fully to Jesus, you'll never have a crisis, you'll never have a problem. Nobody misread me on that. I'm not trying to say that at all, but I will say you'll be better off than you would be otherwise. And this is exactly what Daniel and his companions experienced. So they received a benefit in their body. They received a benefit in their mind. But not only that, they received a spiritual benefit. Look at it here in verse 17. Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God blessed them supernaturally. You see, their purity of heart, their faithfulness to God, it came before their enlightenment in divine mysteries. Do you want to go deeper with God? Are you really committed to him? Do you want to go deeper with God than are you eating in the king's cafeteria? Do you want to go deeper with God? Are you embracing some known area of impurity? And I'm not trying to say that you earn depths with God by your purity. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's a sense in which they're mutually exclusive. You're trying to go deeper with a God who is holy. Holiness needs to be reflected in your life. Daniel experienced this. He received supernatural visions and dreams because he committed himself to the Lord in a special way. So much so that look at what it says there in verse 19. None was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You you know, you can imagine these guys were tempted to not stand out because they would be thought of as religious weirdos. I don't want to be religious weirdo, so I'm not, but they weren't. No, I'm, go, I'm going to do it. I'm willing to be considered the religious weirdo. And what did God do? He enabled them to truly stand out in excellence above everybody else. What a gift from God. Finally, we see verse 21, that thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. God blessed Daniel and his companions in the long run. He blessed them physically, he blessed them intellectually, he blessed them spiritually, and he blessed them in the long run. Daniel had a long, successful career in the worst of circumstances. Even when there was a regime change and the Persians conquered the Babylonians, Daniel still found a high place in the Persian regime because he was so sold out to God. You see, Daniel and his friends show us that inner conviction can overcome any outer pressure and that God-honoring convictions bring forth God-blessed and God-honoring rewards. That's the life of Daniel there. Now, what they did not say, and I can end with this, what they did not say is this. We'll be committed to God in this way. We'll live this life of no compromise later. There are very few people who are followers of Jesus Christ who would say, I'll never go deeper with Jesus. I'll never follow him in a more consecrated way. I'll never give up these areas of, of, of silliness and stupidity. My life. They're very, they'll say, but what they'll say is, oh no, I, I'll get those things right with God later. You know, I'll get it right with God once I graduate. Once I graduate, no, then it's time to get serious. Uh, once the kids are out of the house, oh no, man, then I'm really going to seek after the Lord. When I get that next promotion, you better believe, no, I sold out for Jesus then. Do you see what a masterful job the devil does? He he doesn't tell you never. He just tells you later. And we believe it. Now Daniel and his friend said, now, now is the time. Today is the day. And if now is the time, today is the day for anything, it's to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer. And after I pray the prayer, uh, Scott and Maddie and Joseph are going to be out here to lead us in worship. When they do that, I'm going to give an invitation for anybody here who wants to commit their life to Jesus Christ to to do so. 
And I'd ask if you are a believer already that you just be praying. And what I'm simply gonna do is simply gonna give you a a non-manipulative invitation to respond to the work that God's doing on your heart. You say, I wanna be a believer. Or you know what? Maybe you made a commitment to Jesus in the past, but honestly, you know in your heart, you have fallen so far away from that commitment, you feel like you need to do it again. If that's your case, in just a moment, I'm gonna give you an invitation to come forward. But don't believe the lie that you could or should do it later. Now is the day, today is the time. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you more than anything that our blessed rescuer, Jesus Christ, never compromised. That Jesus was put to the test and passed on every front. We thank you that Jesus never defiled himself and is therefore fully capable to be our rescuer. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us on the cross. But Lord God, we pray right now simply in Jesus' name that you would work in us a greater spirit of commitment and boldness to where in whatever place, Lord, of the hundreds of people in this room, each one has a different place where they're challenged to stand for you. I pray that you would bless and strengthen them and give them the passion and the strength to do that before you now. We're thankful, Lord, that Jesus himself dwells inside of us. And we pray, Lord God, that his no compromise spirit would fill our life. Do it, Father, in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.